Tell me if this sounds familiar. You text your ex, but get a one word response, or maybe you get far enough to get back on the phone with them to engage them in a conversation, but something is off. They're distant, not really interested in having a conversation with you anymore. Carefree conversations are a thing of the past. Well, today I'd like to talk to you about what you can do if you're dealing with a very closed off ex. So I started my career off helping individuals get either their ex-boyfriends back or their ex-girlfriends back. And I'm happy to say I've been relatively successful in that endeavor, but I wasn't always. In fact, when I first started out, I wasn't very good at recommending advice that would help people do that. And that's really how it goes. You start something for the first time and you're not going to be the best at it, but as time goes on, you sort of figure out what works and what doesn't work and you get better at your craft. So I've been doing this for about 10 years now, and I've had a lot of time to sit back and really focus and look in at the data points that I feel like are important to look at. And what's interesting is my assumptions going into what worked were a lot different than what the data actually showed. So I always approach my clients by telling them to really engage in sympathetic behavior to get their exes back. But when we actually dug down deep, we found out that sympathetic behavior doesn't work at all. The key to winning an ex back is through empathy. The key to getting an ex to open up is through empathy. So what's the difference between sympathy and empathy? Well, sympathy is when you share the feelings of another, but empathy is when you understand the feelings of another, but you don't necessarily share them. It all boils down to understanding the other side's point of view, not feeling the other side's point of view, but understanding it. And there is a small distinction to make there. Now I know it sounds like a simple concept, but you'd be surprised at how often people misunderstand this. And I'm actually gonna share a story from John Gottman, who's sort of the father of all the savior marriage systems that you see out there. And he tells a really interesting story that I think perfectly boils down this empathy point. So when John Gottman, who's a very well-known author and you know save your marriage system type person, he's probably the height, the tippy top of the industry. When he was first starting out, he needed to go to a publisher to convince them to advertise his book. There's just one problem. The publisher didn't want to give him any money at all. So he had to go sit down with the publisher and basically make a pitch. And the publisher asked him one simple question. He said, give me one thing that I can do to make my marriage with my wife stronger. And Gottman simply replied, understand what her dreams are. The publisher gets up and immediately leaves the room, jumps on a subway, goes home, and asks his wife, what are your dreams? He had realized that he hadn't done the simple empathy thing that John Gottman was recommending. He didn't know what his wife's dreams were. After that, obviously, the publisher was so impressed that they ended up giving funding. John Gottman blew up and now he is the success he is today. But it really hits the mark here. If you want to get someone to open up to you, you need to empathize and understand what is going on from their point of view. But we're dealing with an ex here, someone who you should theoretically understand because you've been with them for so long. So what can we do? Well, in my opinion, that's where tactical empathy comes into play. One of my favorite reads of the past few years has been a book by Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. Now, Chris Voss is a world-renowned hostage negotiator. He was one of the FBI's top hostage negotiators, in fact, and he basically wrote a book teaching people how to negotiate. And he talks about this concept called tactical empathy. My thinking or my worldview was if someone can successfully succeed in a hostage negotiation, well, successfully talking to an ex should be pretty far down the wrong. So Chris Voss talks about tactical empathy, but what is tactical empathy? Well, tactical empathy is all about listening and understanding the other side's point of view. This is especially important to marriage and desire when it comes to getting the other person to open up. So understanding the other side's point of view is the key to tactical empathy. And there are six ways that you can achieve it. And I like to call them the six tenets of tactical empathy. Effective pauses, back channel cues, mirroring, labeling, paraphrasing, and summarizing. 
Now, you may think you know what each one of these is, but guess what? You really don't. So we're going to go one by one and teach you. So by the end of this video, not only will you have an understanding of how you can get NX to open up, but you will have at least the tools of the trade that you can use on anyone to get them to open up. So this is a more all-encompassing video than you're probably used to. But let's get started right now with effective pauses. When you're talking with someone, it goes without saying that you need to pause. There's a sort of back and forth part to this. You ask an open-ended question, you pause and allow the other person to respond. Seems like pretty basic advice, but again, you'd be surprised at how often people don't allow this advice to come into play. They simply trudge ahead. Why? Well, I think it has to do with our fear of silence. How often is it that you're talking with someone, you ask them a question, and then there's a long pause, and it feels awkward, and you feel like there needs to be something to fill the silence, because otherwise the other person isn't enjoying the conversation. But if you pause, and you're confident in your pause, and you allow the person to think through their response, it's going to make them feel a little bit more heard. Don't be afraid of effective pauses. Tenant number two, back channel cues. Now these are the little things that we say in a conversation with someone that reassures the other person that we're listening to them. So it can be any of the following. Mm-hmm, ah, uh-huh, yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes a back channel cue doesn't have to be anything that we're verbalizing, it could be something that we're actually doing. So let's imagine you and I are having a conversation, you are talking, and I'm nodding my head. It's an affirmative to you to let you know I am listening and understanding what you're saying. Makes you feel more heard, makes you want to continue. That's the back channel cue. Tenant number three, mirroring. You've probably heard of this before, but essentially you are mirroring what someone says and repeating it back to them. So imagine you have a friend and your friend says that they're really thinking about breaking up with their current boyfriend or a girlfriend and they say the following. I don't know what to do or how to do it. It's been so long since I've broken up with anyone. I'm just dreading it. The correct way to mirror this back so that they feel heard is like this. Yeah, 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 you're dreading it. Man, that sounds awful. So you see how I kind of combined the last tenant with back channel cues, the yeah, 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 with also the mirroring, you're dreading it. Again, makes them feel heard, makes them feel understood. And it really makes a big difference in how you're communicating with another person. And the trick to this is it feels completely unnatural to you, but weirdly enough, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the other person feels heard and they will continue talking because they like to talk. They like to talk about themselves. Tenant number four is labeling, and this is arguably the strongest and most important one for you to learn. So what is labeling? Well, labeling is nothing more than you putting on your detective hat, walking a mile in your partner's, or in your case, your ex-partner's shoes, and understand what they're feeling, and then label their emotions to them. Are they feeling joy, awe, happiness, regret, anger? Use your perception, put on your detective hat, figure out what they're feeling, and then repeat that feeling back to them. And this only works if they feel like you are reading their mind. And you usually want to start out the label by saying it seems like or it looks like. Let's use the fake breakup analogy that I use to kind of illustrate this point. So we know for a fact that your friend is dreading this breakup. They don't want to do it because they're really kind of feeling awkward about a potential blow up that their ex is going to have or their soon to be ex is going to have. So imagine this, your friend goes, I don't know what to do or how to do it. It's been so long since I've broken up with anyone, I'm just dreading it. In order to label their emotions here, you can say, yeah, wow, it, it seems like you're really worried at uh, how Rebecca or Chris is going to react to this news. So the other way to kind of view labeling is you're reading the subtext and repeating it out loud. So when your ex is saying like, I'm dreading this breakup with my ex, ex-girlfriend. The subtext is that they're dreading it for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're going to hurt someone's feelings. But also, number two, they're worried about how the person is going to react to it. That is the subtext that they are maybe not saying out loud. Your job with labeling is to find the subtext and repeat it back to them. And that makes them feel like you understand them in a way that most people don't, that you get them. Tenant number five is called paraphrasing. 
So paraphrasing has a lot in common with mirroring. With mirroring, you're simply uh, using the own person's words and mirroring and saying that back to them. With paraphrasing, you're gonna do the same thing except instead of using the other person's words, you're going to use your own words. I'm not gonna really give you an example here because I feel like it is just another version of mirroring that you can implement. Instead, let's move on to the sixth and final tenet, summarizing. So summarizing is in effect kind of combining labeling and paraphrasing together, except you're going to have an actual conversation within the summarizing thing. So I'm gonna use a different analogy here because I feel like it will not work as well with the breakup thing, but I'm gonna use one for my own life. So I, throughout my entire life, have had a lot of stomach issues. So I get an upset stomach very easily. It kind of is a genetic factor in my family. But at the same time, I really like to eat bad foods. So one of the things that oftentimes my wife or even my mom will tell me is that I need to go see a GI doctor to get it checked out to make sure it's not anything serious. And oftentimes what happens is we'll say, oh yeah, 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 that's right, sure, yeah, I'll do that. And then of course I never go. And they might be a lot more likely to get me to actually do it if they approached the ask a different way. So they're very direct about it. They say, look, you need to get this checked out. This could be dangerous. But what they've not been able to do is understand exactly the reason why I don't want to go to a GI doctor. And I'm gonna kinda give it here. The reason I don't wanna go to a GI doctor, and this is completely stupid, is I don't want a GI doctor to say like, oh yeah, you have an upset stomach, you're lactose intolerant or whatever they end up saying. And they say, these are the only kind of foods you can eat. You can't eat all those good foods that you love. I don't want to do that because I know once I do that, I'll have to do that and then it's going to suck. My wife doesn't know. My mom doesn't know. It's a stupid, silly reason. I realize that. But if they were to summarize it to me, they might actually get me to go. So how would that look? Well, let's have a pretend conversation. Let's say I'm having a stomach ache and I say, wow, I, I can't stand this anymore. So my wife will say something like, yeah, I understand. It sounds like you're really frustrated with how much pain you're in. This is, once again, labeling. And then I say, I know, I know, you're gonna sit there and tell me to go see a doctor. To which my wife will probably go, well, why don't you want to? To which I'll say, I don't know. And then my wife will say, are you worried you're gonna find something scary? And then I'll say, I think it's more than that. I just don't want to go. And then my wife says, it sounds like you're afraid that the doctor is going to put you on some sort of diet that you don't want to be on. And then I'll say, that's right. It's a fake conversation, completely a little forced, but you get the idea. You're basically summarizing in a very slow, methodical process by using everything that you've learned to help the other person feel like you understand them better than anyone else. And once you feel that you have a connection with that person, that that person has enough knowledge of what's going through your mind or through their mind, they're a lot more likely to open up. And this is the main problem with most of our clients. Most of our clients do not have these type of conversations with their ex. They're too focused on saying the cool thing, but the cool thing isn't really said in one simple text message phrase or really turn of the phrase in a phone conversation. The cool thing is getting down and making the person feel like you understand them better than they understand themselves. And that takes time and it takes your ability to apply all of these six things. One final thing. A lot of times when people are going through breakups, there's a tendency to want to be right. And this really isn't about being right. Not about being right or wrong. It's about pushing that to the side and understanding their point of view, even if their point of view is warped and incorrect. Because in the end, what we're trying to do is bridge a gap. You have someone who doesn't want anything to do with you, and you want something to do with them. You're trying to bridge that gap, and you do not do that by alienating the other person. You do that by understanding the other person's point of view, and then slowly, very carefully, having conversations with them so that they can understand your point of view, and that is how you build a connection. You're trying to resonate with them on a level so that they are saying, that's right, you, you get it. And once that happens, you'll find that they're going to open up to you a lot easier.